so I'm Naomi Stein, Marissa. Um, we're going to be kind of giving you a kind of big picture introduction to the to the issues that we're talking about, and we're sort of here to set kind of a policy foundation to this conversation, and then some of the other folks at the table are going to get into kind of a more uh, technical methods oriented <coughs> discussion of uh, what we can do about basically these challenges. So um, adaptive right sizing, um, I just want to talk a little bit, Greg I think covered this pretty well, but learning objective, you know, we're trying to help you see some of the methods and tools that are out there for uh, evaluating and implementing right sizing situations. The goal always is to unlock economic value and increase efficiency. It's basically saying, where are things out of alignment? How do we notice and what do we do about it? Um, and, you know, we're going to be sharing um, findings from two different studies, the NCHRP Project 1914, which is like just about to be published online, so I know you're all waiting with bated breath. It's coming, I promise. Um, and then also FHWA's uh, opportunities and trade-offs of this last month, which I don't know if or when it will be published, but it's completed, so hopefully it will be published soon. We promise. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to start with motivation, and uh, here actually the New York Times did a little bit of work for me, um, which was really nice. So um, the, basically the conversation on rights and everything like Art said, it started with this idea of disinvestment, like we don't have enough money, we don't have enough money. But when we started looking at that problem closer, we realized that it was really about an ev evolving world and reality and trying to recognize the change that then changes what we need out of our transportation system. So I'm just going to flip through some things quickly. These are from an analysis that the New York Times published recently about what's changed in the past decade. So, uh, you know, in this slide, left-hand side, I think, is like 2012. Right-hand side is 2018 in this metro area. It's sort of showing you the pace of change. Um, similarly, this is just outside of Houston. Same kind of time frame. It's like six years. All of a sudden, you have totally new landscape and geography. Um, and it's not just about you know suburban development popping up, it's also about urban redevelopment. So this is a couple shots they had left-hand side. It's highlighting some parking spaces, and right-hand side is like, well, you know, now those are buildings because the reality changed around those parcels and it meant that there was a new, better use for that land. Um, and so what we're talking about is sometimes maybe there's a new, better use for transportation as well along with that. Um, again, left and right, like open space, that's an Amazon facility. So, you know, it's not just people that are changing the reality, it's also sort of the economy and freight is changing the physical environment, changes transportation needs. Um, and it also happens in the opposite direction. So this is Detroit, um, I believe <coughs> left hand side and then right hand side, you're actually seeing some contraction there, and so, you know, things are moving in different directions, different parts of the country. Um, and, you know, with the geography, the landscape of the economy, you know, our mobility options are also changing. So, sometimes it's major infrastructure investments, like, like transit, and, you know, what does that mean for the rest of the network once these systems come online? Um, but it's also things like all our new mobility options, we'll talk a little bit about that. So, um, that's kind of the why or sort of what's in the background of this need. So in terms of what are we talking about for, uh, you know, what is the right sizing opportunity, basically what we're talking about is, you know, we've got a significant portfolio of aging infrastructure, unstable funding, I'm sure everyone's kind of, you don't need to be told about those things. Um, but it's really about trying to be more proactive and sort of identifying places where things are not aligned. So things maybe are out there that we've been owning and taking care of for decades, but they're not quite doing what they were designed to do. Or when you're looking forward, um, trying to sort of take into account trends that might change or be uncertain about what you're building in the future. Um, and now it's my turn. <laughs> As Naomi and Greg were kind of alluding to, um, disinvestment is sort of another side of the right sizing point. This research all started with that, and it's kind of grown to say instead of being concerned about um, just being 
reactively proactive? What can we do, not just with our existing infrastructure, but with where we're going with our uh, future infrastructure? So this investment is more focused on existing facilities and more focused on, uh, we have a cost constraint that we're trying to mitigate, whereas right sizing is a broader picture and going beyond that. Um, so disinvestment tends to, it's more the partial or complete withdrawal of resources from your existing facilities. It's looking at either long-term modifications um, and maintenance to reflect the new and changing needs. It's, again, usually reactive, um, is, uh, initiated by funding gaps and reassessing existing conditions. And even though it's reactive, sometimes it can be passed for active or sometimes it happens kind of forced into it by policy changes. Um, but we focus more on the race and the realm on active disinvestment. So now, um, was going to talk about right sizing. Yeah, so, you know, these are sort of two ideas in play. Some people are more comfortable with one term over the other. Some people are uncomfortable with all of the terms. So, you know, we've raised You mean like disinvestment? Yeah, yeah. disinvestment, um, right. It is a sorry, it's a difficult topic, but I think what we're trying to focus on is kind of the upside value of it. So our, our definition that we came to in the right sizing research was a, a process by which a transportation agency makes intentional decisions as opposed to just sort of letting things happen to adjust the size, the extent, the function, or the composition of either your existing infrastructure or in some cases the way you're thinking about planning for the future. And it's, it's about trying to avoid over or underbuild, trying to match investments to the markets that are out there and really the point is to be economically as well as fiscally sustainable over time. Um, these are just a couple of examples of right sizing. So for example, the Tennessee Department of Transportation, they took a really strategic look at relaxing things like design standards and that allowed them to save a significant amount of money. So that's a very kind of standards oriented, maybe engineering approach, Rochester, New York, uh, looked at a second section of expressway that really wasn't carrying what it was originally designed for and said, well, maybe this thing needs to be different for the future of our metro region, and they went out and changed it. Um, the, the Dallas, Texas example um, is sort of, I think still sort of kind of in process, but they came up with this process of looking at all of their assets and saying, are they really doing the best and highest use that they could be, or is there potential to be other things with these, this land or this space, um, and so identifying some of the opportunities there. Um, that's just a before and after rendering from Rochester. We should probably get new new graphics there. It's been a little while, but um, maybe some pictures. <laughs> yeah. Um, ah, so on the topic of what sort of approaches you can take, and like right sizing, the disinvestment research, we focused on active. Um, active responses and active strategies. So not just reacting and dealing with whatever happens, but how do you assess whether or not this is a, the right approach? Um, so normally, you make investment decisions looking at your maintenance costs, repair, or expansion. And the independent research that all of us have done, starting with Synthesis 480, uh, kind of lands at the same spot on different types of right sizing decisions. There's five sort of main strategies, um, deferring or disinvesting through not doing anything, basically relaxing, waiving uh, conditions of performance data standards, modifying the design, um, the design standard or its target, so basically reclassifying, say you have a decrease in population in your roadways, no longer used to the extent that it used to be, consider relaxing your standards and um, lowering the, <coughs> the needs on the roadway. Um, you can replace it by making it smaller or more economical to better fit the current, the current and Conditions. You can decommission it to allow for the reuse of land. A lot of rail to trail type infrastructure is a form of disinvestment. Um, or you can relinquish or change jurisdictions. So turn it over to either a private operator or um, back over to a state from a local agency or a state turning it over to a local agency from a state, depending on the budget perspectives. Um, so, with that, setting the stage, we'll talk a little bit more about the particular study that we did for FHWA. Sorry. Uh-oh. Okay, we're good. Um, on the opportunities and trade-offs of disinvestment, um, kind of looking at uh, diagnostics for disinvestment situations. 
So this work involved a synthesis report um, on a literature review and strategies and methods, and then developing a modeling framework to assess for um, agencies to take and strategically assess whether or not this is a potential option for them. It never, it didn't really make decisions, but sort of framing the questions and collecting the information that you may need in order to go further in your decision making. So FHW was inter interested in looking at the processes, um, defining it, and just understanding what is available and developing the framework. So what justifies this investment? What conditions lead you to being in this spot? Um, what's entailed in deciding, making the decision whether or not to disinvest? So it's a very strategic element, not just willy-nilly saying, okay, we're just not gonna spend money on this, on this asset anymore. We're just done. But basically, try and figure out what the best economic approach would be, and which is gonna have the greatest overall economic impact, um, economic benefit. So there's, as I mentioned, passive versus active decisions. Um, passive decisions occur with indirect policy intervention, may lead to new opportunities, but it's not really planned or strategically thought out. Active are the conscious and structured policy choice of whether or not to um, uh, sorry, withdraw your resources from your infrastructure and put them somewhere else where they have a better and higher use. Um, so if you've gotten to this point and you're thinking about this and you're making the strategic decision, what do you do? So what we did was develop a two-part high-level framework to sort of determine whether or not initiating this action is a good strategy. Um, the, first day, the first part is to determine whether it's a viable option. So ask yourself some really strategic questions on whether or not this might be a valuable approach. And then the second part is sort of outlining and collecting some information that you may need to identify the key conditions and the potential economic outcomes from um, the decisions that you may or may not make. Recognizing that every situation is unique and there are variations on any elements within the framework itself. So, might this investment be viable? Um, the first step is to evaluate your baseline conditions. What are the goals of your agency? What are the constraints? And what key decision criteria do you have? So, why am I doing this? Has something changed in my budget? Has my population shifted? Have the core economic centers? What's, what's driving me to be in this spot where I may need to think about this? What goals am I trying to achieve? What, time, uh, what limitations exist to doing this? Am I going to you know, severely limit a restricted access population? And am I going to do something um, that might cause serious issues? And then how would I decide? And so we've developed a series of questions, a little bit more detailed on getting getting to answers to these and trying to sit down and figure out whether or not this works. And if you can complete all four steps and come up with well thought out answers to this, then consider moving forward to the second part. And if you can't, then maybe this investment isn't the right decision for you because you haven't made enough progress in your, um, in your thought process and maybe come back to it later and consider some other options. So if you are able to move to part B. The next step is to sort of answer some key decision questions, such as, um, do I have performance measures for the book? Uh -oh. Same one. Sorry. Um, do I have performance measures? Do I have ways of tangibly Flip back through all the slides, a little quicker pressure. Um, ways of tangibly measuring some of these outcomes. Has the use of the asset declined over time? Um, does the asset still serve its intended purpose? And basically, you see little triangles along the way that are pause, pause things. And if you answer no to any of the questions along the way, then maybe this is not the right way to continue. And maybe you should um, go to a broader, more, more broad right-sizing approach and uh, extend beyond this uh, single consideration. If you do get through step six and you've, you've answered all of the decision questions, then the next step is to sort of identify the economic issues. What has happened with the population over the past 10 years and what are the projections for the population? Have employment centers shifted? Um, what is the condition of the asset or the system? What environmental impacts might happen? Um, what user expectations or cost 
impacts, land use, and agency finances. And this is sort of an information collecting exercise. And then uh, collecting the relevant data and using appropriate tools such as um, a critical closeness accessibility, network robustness, wow, network robustness index, um, location specific vulnerability index, and just kind of looking and assessing and evaluating and making sure that you're not going to harm any populations, um, doing, using your available sketch planning tools for your agency, and just giving this a well thought out <coughs> evaluation of what might happen to the economy or what economic impacts may be associated with this thought of potentially disinvesting. <coughs> Excuse me. And then after that, uh, you want to summarize the results of these tools and this approach that you've taken, review the outcomes to assess the opportunities and the trade-offs, do the perceived benefits outweigh the negative, the potentially negative impacts, and consider doing a thorough, detailed like benefit cost or financial financial analysis to summarize your outcomes. And then if you've made it through this process, this is really just a framework to decide whether or not this may work. Um, sets the, the tone to initiating the process, which is going to go back to what Naomi's talking about in the right side of the research. Okay, so I think, um, no, it's fine. Um, so I think, you know, what Marissa was talking about is kind of a very um, sort of project or situation-oriented kind of step-by-step -step approach to say, do I have a problem? Can I actually characterize it? Are there real solutions? Do I know how to analyze them? And what do I do about it? Um, the, the NCHRP, the 1914 research, um, it has those kind of step-by-step -step procedures. And I think it's actually kind of nice that two research projects sort of came into alignment, which means we're onto something. But it also took a step back and said, <laughs> You know, how do you do this, not just at a like project by project level, but how do you build this into the way that you think about planning and what your agency does in general? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that just to kind of give the big picture of what, what would it mean to have right sizing as kind of a paradigm shift. Um, so just so you know, and because I know you're really excited about the things that are about to be posted on the web. We've got two products from the NCHRP uh, 1914 project. The first is policy guidance, which really talks about the sort of like who, what, in what context you make these kinds of decisions. And then there's a toolkit that goes with it that says, okay, you know, fine, big picture is fine, but you actually need some analytical methods. How do you use the kind of tools inside of your agency? to make decisions. Um, so I wanna, I'm gonna stick on the policy side of things, and then. Just a very quick point. Live from the front. Live from the front. The, the reports and all of the supportable information were published two days ago, and are all now available online for free download. Raw. As, as report 917. Okay. So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have access. Come on, Crowder. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so forget every time you've ever heard the number 1914 and now remember the number 917. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So right side your memory there. Awesome. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I think one of the sort of barriers to talking about this that we find is people people sort of say, well, like, tell me what the right size is. Um, and I think it's really important to put out that there's no, there's no sort of single right size, and it's also not a static equation. The whole point is to be keeping track over time of where things might be misaligned because of things that change. Now, that can either be your context has changed with the original... Um, Good word. I love context. Context. The original sort of purpose and need, if you're an engineer, uh, just isn't what it was. Or it might be that we're smarter than we used to be, or now we recognize things that we didn't used to, and so we understand better what our communities need, and we want to integrate that knowledge into our decision making. Um, so we came up with a framework where it says right-sizing decisions are really about reaching alignment among who owns something, who's responsible for its upkeep on an ongoing basis, 
Uh, who pays for it? So who sort of secures benefit from it? Um, who uses it and why? And then who actually makes decisions about things? And um, you can see, I'll, sh I'll talk about partnerships in a little bit. Not Those things are not always in the same agency or in the same community. Um, Rightsizing is also about proactively recognizing change and uncertainty. We identified really two um, key types of that. It's kind of economic de demand risk. So, you know, when you put something in place or when you put money into something that already exists, you're always at risk either for demand outpacing um, what you anticipated, and so then you'd be at a loss, or actually falling short of that demand, in which case you have overinvested and you could have used those resources for something. Else. Uh, the other side of the equation is technology risk, which is, you know, how do you think about the uncertainty of either putting money into something that then maybe later won't be useful versus uh, putting money into something to make sure that you can take advantage of something in the future. Um, it's also about asking key questions at every step, so the guidance has kind of a uh, project life cycle that you can walk through, some key questions. So for example, you know, if you have a major reconstruction or replacement project kind of coming up on your, you know, your asset management tracking and you see something that's coming maybe to the end of its useful life, instead of just saying, well, just like fix it, make it the way it is now, you would ask, you know, what has changed about the underlying purpose and need for this since its construction? Are there, and so, you know, is it still doing the same thing, or are there issues related to efficient delivery or return on investment that might mean someone should own something different? Like, if, you know, maybe, speed it up. She was slow, okay. Um, it might mean that actually you're not the best equipped to control this thing or maintain this thing. Sometimes there's questions like that. Um, the other thing we came to in this research is that right sizing has to happen through partnerships because you really need three things to right size. You need to know what's going on, that's intelligence. You need authority in the sense that you can actually make changes and you need resources, that's both money and sort of like staff know-how. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes those things are all in one place and sometimes they're not. So sometimes it might be you know, local government understands the context of a corridor, state DOT controls the right of way and the access to that corridor, and private developers um, really know what's going on right adjacent to it. Um, uh, I think the, so related to the partnerships is sort of how do you initiate uh, right sizing, and um, we, initiation is basically the, the most important part because, you know, for other decisions we have systems that tell us when it's time to do something, like fix something, but there's no generally accepted trigger for considering a right sizing decision, so I think that's what some of the other people at the table are going to talk about, is like, what is that trigger, how do you tell? Um, I think the last thing, maybe in terms of uh, thinking about right sizing as a matter of policy, is that uh, if you're thinking about right sizing, you have to be thinking about why you're doing it, or it doesn't work. It just sort of turns into general planning. And we, it, to, for it to be right sizing, it has to address one of these three things: either reducing or managing life cycle costs, achieving the best and highest use of something, or aligning who's funding, who's deciding, and who's using better than it is currently. Um, so, are we doing discussion, or should I hand? Could you just pause on those discussion questions because that will inform our workshop to some extent, right? Okay. So remember that. We'll come back to that. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so I am going to hand it out. This is today's agenda. I'll hand it off to Jeff to talk about real experience.